So the next speaker in this session is John Statham. Um, John is a practitioner from Yorkshire and he's also uh, a partner in the uh, Raft Solutions um, Enterprise. I'm not sure I can say company or enterprise. Um, so John's going to talk to us today um, about using sand as a bedding for cows. Thank you, Kat. And uh, thanks very much for the invitation to speak here this afternoon. Uh, great to talk to you. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so, yeah, this afternoon, I want to really talk about um, sort of some new thoughts about recycling solutions, particularly for sand. Um, Raft Solutions is all about sustainable food. It's really based from two veterinary practices in the north and the southwest of England and part of the wider Exile Vets group. So this is very much about practical questions that are coming from time on farm and therefore looking for practical solutions of how we can produce food sustainably. So the goals. I think very briefly, we try to look at kind of how to characterise sort of cattle bedding materials, asking some questions within the sustainable food group at Newcastle University, who we're working with. Uh, also look at how we can evaluate different recycling treatment processes. So a few slightly different ideas how we might recycle kind of bedding materials. And finally, to ask some largely unanswered questions about the ecology of kind of bedding and that wider process of the bedding cycle. In other words, how it comes in and how it goes back out again. By the way, that's about the only goal that we scored in the kind of uh, recent weeks, but there we go. Okay, so Jude set a fantastic kind of baseline about sustainable food production. You know, great talk again, setting the importance of really understanding what sustainable food production is all about, and therefore about impacts. And bedding is part of that. So if we look at food security, if we look at the environmental impact of actually producing food, whether it's through the atmosphere, through into water, or actually through into kind of land degradation, we all seem to figure in how health and welfare is influenced by that environmental impact. And of course, just crossing the line into antimicrobial resistance and One Health, you know, what is going on in that microbial population in our livestock food production systems? So two of the most negative sort of impacts on health on our dairy farms are mastitis and lameness. And there's definitely a role for managing cattle bedding in those two aspects. So sustainable bedding. Well, bedding materials, what properties do we want? They should be comfortable, highly absorbent, pretty useful, um, non-slippery, non-abrasive, and low in environmental bacteria. So we have different systems. It might be peat in Ontario. Um, there's a nice bit of peat bedding there. It might be sand systems. It may be sawdust. It may be straw. <coughs> it may be grass. The point being there are lots of options. And when we get it right, we produce comfort, and we produce very good hygiene. When we get it wrong, we've got the risk of lesions, the risk of injuries, the risk of serious disease such as mastitis. And if we just follow this, uh, this little arrow here, th these cows are standing up on this bedding. The reason why is if they lie down, they might die. And actually, it's not because <coughs> of the bacterial load. When there's pressure on the dairy industry, we go cheap. This bedding was free. It was kind of wood. Um, it was reclaimed wood. I found shards of glass this big in it, nails this big in it, and bits of window frame. So um, you get what you pay for. Those cows rarely actually lay down because if they did, they were injured when they got up again. So there's a price to pay for bedding, and understanding how we can achieve that is really important. Okay, so glorious gold standard. Sand, lovely beach, blue sky. Definitely not in the UK. <laughs> um, but actually, the point being here is that, you know, we consider sand as a gold standard because we've got really good evidence that it produces that comfort and hygiene conditions. And we've got good evidence that we can manage mastitis risk and lameness risk if we do a good job with the environment. Sand's been part of that solution. The problem is availability, cost, and management challenges with actually keeping it on farm. Uh, and you know, our farmers are paying around 15 to 20 pound a tonne at the moment for this. Um, now, there's a, a, a geological survey report suggesting that, that Yorkshire's only got nine years more of sand. Now, if you bear in mind that in nine years, Yorkshire will be its own independent republic, then this becomes quite an important point to kind of manage, that we will run out of available sand kind of in the People's Republic of Yorkshire. So the risk then is that, you know, we also got the challenge that it is a hassle. It requires a lot of capital investment and management time to manage slurry if we've got sand in it. And we therefore get farmers turning to other alternatives, as I've already discussed, that may be less good for health, welfare, sustainability. 
And we maybe have more unknowns as well in some of those products of actually the longer term picture for actually that microbial ecology on farms. And sand doesn't stay clean, it gets dirty. And a product coming into a farm is not necessarily the same when it leaves. And again, although the literature is slightly split on this, um, there's evidence that some recycled sand is actually just the same quality as pre-use. But how good was it to start with? So we've got lots of questions here about kind of bedding quality. So the literature is kind of uh, fairly wide on this in terms of both systems for recycling in terms of the mitigation of risk for lameness and mastitis. As Martin Green did yesterday, I want to put a shameless plug in for a very good book on dairy herd health that does look at some of these factors as well. Um, but our aim really with this work with Newcastle University's Institute for Sustainability was can we find methods by which we can actually recycle sand and reuse it safely but also economically? So four questions asked really, four kind of pilot investigations, and I emphasise pilot, it's ongoing work. The first thing is can we characterise bedding materials with some different questions than we do in a normal way? Can we go to the material science departments in these universities and actually move away from the agricultural expertise and ask material scientists what's going on here? How do they measure things? How do they characterise stuff? Can we look at different processes, different engineering companies? We've talked to different engineers of how they manage things in the water engineering sector and actually domestic waste recycling, asking how they process large volumes of material and try and make it safe. And also, is there a sustainability question? Can we use that organic material in bedding? and harness it in terms of anaerobic digestion to try and actually generate some energy from them. And last but not least, is it even feasible? So on the face of it, not a very sustainable looking picture, um, but actually there's some massively industrial autoclaving processes that go on that turn landfill waste into much smaller volumes of actually quite safe, actually inert materials. So industrial autoclaving in the same way that we use for surgical materials gets used to actually upgrade the sort of safety aspect and reduce the impact of domestic landfill waste. In the same way, we actually have now quite a large spare capacity of furnace industry in the UK as we've shut most of it down from the steel industry. So again, the People's Republic of Yorkshire needs to use those steel refineries in Sheffield and in the North East. So actually, there is infrastructure in place that can process and refine waste. It's already there. It's not capital investment, and it's actually already in place. And there are opportunities to use those resources imaginatively. OK, so the approach was, let's try and identify these barriers to sustainable bedding. So we're going to characterise different products, look at some comparisons, for example, to recycle manure solids. And David Black's going to take this theme up um, in a couple of talks' time. So I'm not going to go into detail, David, but just flag it as an alternative comparator, really, in recycling. And then also just look at different sorts of ways of treating, um, sort of particularly bedding sand, but uh, comparison systems. So the difference here is, is that we've looked at material solutions. So we're actually characterising bedding based on physical, chemical and biological approaches. So we're looking at total organic carbon, total organic nitrogen and phosphorus, and also looking at respiration potential. So in other words, how much CO2 is produced by the bacteria in these bedding materials, rather than counting colonies. We try to quantify the bacterial load by the bedding's ability to actually respire. Uh, and then we've really compared before and after treatments. So a vast knowledge, of course, that I've got of differential scanning calorimetry. Um, but the team at sort of Newcastle will use a number of different techniques to characterise these materials, and this was one of them. So we went to one of our, our kind of very high-yielding uh, dairy kind of units in North Yorkshire, um, and we basically collected some samples. We looked and characterised it before treatment at different points on the farm. We treated it in different ways and then recharacterised it. So we looked at dry heat treatments, wet heat treatments, in the words autoclaving, straight washing, and then also combinations. And we looked at these different range of parameters in doing that. So essentially there's three main systems. We've got straight washing, so sand settling lanes, you know, mechanical systems where we're just going to wash the sand and therefore settle out that cleaner sand and reuse it. Propane flaming, the, uh, the dairy dragon system. And by the way, if you've not seen a propane rake, you really miss a treat. Um, these are in commercial use. 
And there's good data out there how sanitising beds using these propane rakes is really quite effective in sustaining the life of kind of sand bedding and cubicle systems. And then finally, autoclaving, which is um, there are some quite large autoclaving systems, as I say, that particularly in the northeast of England are being used at the moment to produce safe landfill waste. So here's a study farm. And we, we looked at kind of the, essentially the kind of slurry movement systems here with a, with a reception area and then a very large lagoon at the other end of it. This was a new kind of, uh, a new build site about five years ago with an EU grant. Anyway, moving on to that one. Um, but the, the point being that this was a, a system which was set out to try and be sustainable. Um, and they really invested in high welfare in terms of space and the very best in kind of health and welfare conditions. So we sampled the different points. We sampled both within the cubicles themselves and then at different points within the system. And we categorised these different um, pre and post uh, products, as I've just described. The obvious comment is, it's incredible how different pre and post sand is. You chuck it in there to those cubicles and it is a completely different product very quickly. We get much, much higher levels of both moisture and organic content and therefore the respiration potential goes up in a big way. So, washing is very interesting. It's very effective at cleaning sand. You know, a six wash system kind of in the materials lab at uh, in Newcastle is actually very effective at cleaning sand, and it works very well. It just requires a large amount of area and footprint to produce the infrastructure to do that. And that's a big deal for us in terms of planning and similarly impacting on the environment by putting great big concrete settling lanes in. But it does work very well. So, very quickly, um, the results from these different systems. So first of all, we looked at pre-use sand. It's, it's a fairly low moisture product, less than 5% moisture, and again, about 2.5% kind of organic carbon. What this figure shows here is actually the rate of carbon dioxide accumulation in these samples per hour in a 24-hour period. Uh, the red is when actually we added some extra glucose to kind of challenge that kind of respiration. So this is basically looking at um, in recycled manure solids, Pre-use sand and in-use sand, we're looking at their amount of CO2 that's produced to measure that kind of bacterial load. So pre-use, pretty low. Pretty dry, pretty low respiration. In-use, it shoots up to nearly 20% moisture. Shoots up to nearly 45% organic material. So this is a very different product. This is taken out of the cubicle beds in a twice weekly sand bedded system. Um, that they hadn't dug out for at least six months. But this is still a very high organic material product. If we move on to RMS, not surprisingly, it's an organic product. It's moist at 66% moisture, and it's 91% organic carbon. And, and we use this from another farm that's using green bedding to actually try and compare um, actually the different ways of how we're measuring these different materials. Thanks, Cap. We've now changed the figure here to the total amount of CO2, by the way, produced in 192 hours. So just a slightly different measure. So if we now look at the insert of sand autoclaved, we've got a pretty high moisture product here as well. So if we actually look at the different um, amount of moisture, we've got nearly 17%, and again, a reasonable amount of organic carbon as well. So the autoclaving produced quite a high pathogen load and quite a variety too. So if we actually use that propane rake, if we actually use a furnace-based system, we've got from that dirty sand, we now get a 0.1% moisture product, a 0.1% organic carbon. So we've actually got a product which is drier, lower pathogen load than when we started. You know, and it's very, very different from the other processes that we used. Last but not least, to say just washing was actually very effective in actually reducing the respiration rate but it's quite a moist product, so 18.5% moisture. Okay, so draw this to a close. Um, in effectiveness, the furnace-based systems produce a very, very dry, very, very low pathogen product. It's therefore got great potential in terms of health and welfare, as well as obviously kind of uh, the aspects of reducing the microbial ecology. Wash sand was still very effective, but still damp, whereas the autoclaving systems were pretty dire, in fact, about as much use as a chocolate teapot at the end of the day. So we didn't really see a great future in investing in autoclaving for sand. The anaerobic digestion potential is really very low, so we don't really unfortunately see an opportunity for sand to be harnessed for producing the energy to do this, which is a shame. 
A few questions again that Dave will pick up about the differences in pathogen load between RMS and sand. And an outstanding question of really the work that's going on uh, between Raft and Newcastle is looking at this bigger cycle. What is the ecology? What bacterial population comes into bedding systems and what goes back out again? And the question really is, is dry sand a premium product? So is heat dried sand a premium product that could have a value in humid times of the year and in humid systems? So to finish off, further work really is we're actually at the moment surveying farmers and vets asking their views on whether they would be interested in a central kind of recycling depot or the idea of the kind of the, the furnace wagon that comes onto the farm to do the recycling. Um, we're looking at the kind of thermodynamics and the cost benefit of doing this at the moment and also further work actually using some next generation sequencing and different techniques to try to understand what that microbial ecology is in and out of the sun system. So just to acknowledge my, my colleagues, so Lindsay Blake and Neil Gray up at, uh, and Judith Dix and Christina up at Newcastle and my colleagues at RAF Solutions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, John. Um, we're actually a bit running a bit tight for time, so if anybody does have any questions for John, if they can maybe catch him afterwards, um, and we'll just move on to the next speaker.